Why have you lived? Why have you suffered? Is it all some huge, awful joke? We have to answer these questions somehow if we are to go on living. Indeed, even if we are only to go on dying. These are some of the questions Mahler said he posed in his colossal second symphony, entitled The Resurrection. Gustav Mahler had a spectacular career as a conductor that would eventually peak with two extremely high-profile appointments. First, as General Music Director of the Vienna Staatsoper, and later as the Music Director of the New York Philharmonic. His fame as a composer always trailed behind that of his conducting, but in 1888, he was still relatively unknown even as a conductor, having recently got his first significant post at the Leipzig Opera. But more importantly, he discovered Des Knaben Wunderhorn, the boy's magic horn, an anthology of German poetry with a deeply romantic vein. Something in the poetry resonated with Mahler, unleashing his creative powers. For the next decade, almost all his music was in some way connected with the poetry. Mahler lived at a time in musical history when everything was growing. Orchestras were getting bigger, compositions were getting longer, and the harmonic and emotional language of music was getting more and more complex. We call this trend maximalism, since everything was being pushed to the limits. Just think of the difference between a Strauss tone poem written in the 1880s and Haydn's final symphonies, which were written only 70 years earlier. The speed of the evolution of musical style during the 19th century was dizzying. This helps us understand the enormous scale of Mahler's compositions. He once said to Sibelius, another but entirely different 20th century symphonist, a symphony must be like the world. It must contain everything. Like many others of his generation, Mahler was often happy to provide programs or poetic descriptions of his music, perhaps because he spent his life conducting drama in the opera pit. At a first glance, the 80 minute long second symphony may seem daunting, but by following the story as Mahler outlined it, it unfolds as a thrilling and terrifying psychological drama. So let's dive into the first movement. Mahler wrote this in 1888, five years before the rest of the symphony, originally thinking of it as a standalone piece entitled Totenfeier, meaning funeral rite. He described it as depicting the death of the hero of his first symphony, which ends in great triumph. The second begins with a great shudder in the violins and an angry, defiant growl in the cellos and basses. Although the first movement has moments that hint at transcendence and an escape from the grim reality of death, it ends with an uncompromising chromatic scale in the whole orchestra and a couple of plucked notes in the cellos and basses that sound like earth being thrown onto a coffin. there follows an abrupt change of musical character. In the score, Mahler asks for a pause of five minutes to give the audience time to adjust. He explained the break to a conductor friend like this. This is my fault, and it isn't lack of understanding on the part of the audience. The andante, the second movement, is composed as a sort of intermezzo, like an echo of long past days from the life of him who we carry to the grave in the first movement but while the sun still smiled at him. As Mahler said, the second movement is in an entirely different vein. He uses a very characteristic German word in the score, Gemütlichkeit, which means a sense of homey comfort, like sitting around a fire on a lovely old sofa with a dog at your feet. In other words, miles away from your own funeral. It's a memory of happier times. 
Mahler writes a Ländler, which is an Austrian dance, the precursor of the waltz. It's slower and less grand, but immediately friendly and comforting. Twice during the movement, a grimmer music creeps in, reminding us of the heavy reality outside the music. But we end as we began, reassured. The third movement is the nemesis of the second. Mahler uses a song he had recently written entitled Saint Anthony of Padua and the Fishes, a poem from Des Knaben Wunderhorn. The poem describes how Saint Anthony gets up to preach on Sunday, but his church is empty. So he goes down to the river and delivers his sermon to the fish. The fish listen to his sermon with great interest and then return to their business as if nothing had happened. It's a sarcastic metaphor for life's futility. The text is deeply cynical, and Mahler writes a slithery, sinister kind of music to reflect that. For the version of the song in the second symphony, he removes the singer, but all the meaning is still there. We're back in reality, this time looking at one of the more unpleasant episodes of our hero's life. Mahler now faced the enormous problem of how to write a finale that could answer all the questions he'd posed in the earlier movements. This is a problem that plagued composers for centuries. Think of Eroica, Beethoven's Third Symphony. The first movement seems to span the entire gamut of human feeling. So what can you do next? Beethoven's solution in his symphonies was often to write something joyful, but deliberately lighter in character. But for a romantic like Mahler, that solution wouldn't work. The finale needed to be even bigger than the first movement, all encompassing and convincingly optimistic. It's interesting, whereas for Tchaikovsky, writing at almost the same time as Mahler, his sixth symphony, which we call the Pathétique, could begin with death, have two movements of retrospective thoughts, and then conclude with a finale that also ends with death. For Mahler, a German romantic and Beethoven's heir, death could only be followed by resurrection. There had to be something more. Although later in life, especially in the Sixth Symphony, he would tell a much darker story, it's clear from his writings that he knew the second had to end with life rather than death. To help bridge the gap between the everyday world of the middle movements and the enormity of the finale, Mahler inserted another song with the text from Des Knaben Wunderhorn, this time entitled Urlicht, or Primeval Light. Unlike in the second movement song, this time Mahler keeps the voice in the symphony, a mezzo-soprano who acts as a humanizing comfort, a mother-like figure for our hero. After the slithery, sinister music of the third movement, the sound of the mezzo quietly singing the words, O oh Red Rose, is incredibly moving and reassuring. We leave the song halfway to the afterlife, far away from Earth. But the finale interrupts with an horrific scream in the orchestra.
This drifts into the first of several offstage horn calls echoing around the hall, which create an apocalyptic atmosphere. It's as if we're hearing music from another time and space, far beyond everyday life. Every question from the first movement has returned, demanding an answer. A little later, we hear an enormous crescendo in the percussion, followed by some rather gothic horror-sounding music. Mahler later described this as the world's graves opening and the dead coming back to life. And there follows a march of the dead. To find a text to complete the finale, Mahler claimed he ransacked world literature, including the Bible. For a long time, he was stuck, unable to find the right words to banish the doubt and dread of the previous movements. While he was writing the finale, the great conductor Hans von Bülow died. Von Bülow had been a great influence on Mahler as a conductor, especially during Mahler's time in Leipzig when the two had worked together. But von Bülow had been very resistant to Mahler's music, refusing to program it, claiming he understood nothing about any of Mahler's songs, and declaring to Mahler that the first movement of the second symphony surpassed all acceptable bounds of dissonance when Mahler played it to him on the piano. Yet ironically, von Bülow indirectly helped Mahler find the right text to end the second symphony. Mahler attended von Bülow's funeral, and at its end, the choir sang a chorale to a text by Klopstock. It begins, Auferstehen, ja, Auferstehen wirst du mein Staub nach kurzer Ruhe, meaning rise again, yes, thou shalt rise again, my dust, after a brief rest. Hearing those words unlocked the floodgates of Mahler's imagination, and he rushed home to begin setting the text. He sets it not with triumph, but for a chorus singing extremely softly, almost inaudibly. After the cacophony of the finale, this has a very powerful effect. It's as if these wise, transcendent words have been going on in the background the whole time the symphony has been playing, calm and steadfast in their knowledge of resurrection, despite the anguish and doubt of our hero. Having begun the finale, Mahler wrote to a friend on June 29, 1893, charmingly comparing the composition to childbirth. He wrote, This is to announce the happy arrival of a strong and healthy last movement of the second. Father and child are faring appropriately in the circumstances. The latter is not yet out of danger. By July 25th, he was able to add, It is the most significant thing I have done up to now. Mahler added several of his own stanzas to Klopstock's text, summarizing the drama of the whole symphony, moving from reassurance through doubt to confidence about the nature of life and death. The symphony ends with bells, organ, and full orchestra all playing fortissimo, with our soloists and chorus singing the joyful and affirming lines, rise again, Yes, thou shalt rise again, my heart, in the twinkling of an eye. What thou hast fought for shall lead thee to God.
But this isn't religious music, it's humanistic. Like many composers before him, Mahler struggled to find a text that communicated a universal message of human optimism without resorting to familiar religious imagery. Just as in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Mahler's second proclaims a message of universal hope for all mankind. The effect of Mahler's words, coupled with the overwhelming power of his music, silence all doubts, and without knowing quite how, we are left with a feeling of tremendous elation and confidence that death is not the end for our hero or for us.